large and growing population of patients who are on chronic warfarin therapy. Now, standard perioperative management includes what's called bridging to low molecular weight heparin. Really good, but with the exception of the fact it's not really all that standardized, and with the exception of the bridge trial, not a whole lot of data is available that really is necessary, especially postoperatively. So today we're here to talk about Periop2, which is a double-blind RCT of postoperative low molecular weight heparin bridging therapy for patients at high risk for arterial thromboembolism. And to do that, I am with Dr. Michael Kovacs, who is an MD, and he's from the London Health Sciences Center, Victoria Hospital, London, Ontario. So the experimental arm is placebo in this, which I find fascinating, of course, but you first conducted a multi-center single arm pilot, correct? Let's go back to that, because I think that is a good place to start. And, and that's what brought us to the hypothesis for this study. Um, so back uh, in the days when lomogoid heparin came around, it, it seemed the perfect uh, drug to bridge patients on warfarin with uh, atrial fibrillation and mechanical valves. Uh, but there were all these different uh, strategies that were going on, and so we had our strategy, and we, we I think it was about 200 patients um, that were managed in the same fashion. And the interesting findings that we found from that is that 80% of the thrombotic, adverse thrombotic outcomes were associated with bleeding. And so that suggested to us that the harm was being caused by the actual post-operative bridging therapy itself. So we uh, thought that uh, perhaps uh, not bridging patients would be the best way to go, and hence the design for this study. So after the pilot, it probably was really time for Periop 2. Describe the study. So this study started a long time ago, so <laughs> warfarin is the old drug, and uh, I guess these days isn't even used very much for atrial fibrillation, but it's still used for, for mechanical valves. But um, when we designed the study, we thought that everyone should still get preoperative bridging because preoperative bridging didn't seem likely to be causing any harm as long as you, you gave a low enough dose and stopped it uh, soon enough in advance of the surgery or procedure, it's not gonna cause harm. But we wanted to find out, is the postoperative uh, strategy of no bridging going to be uh, superior? So the strategy was that uh, everyone, uh, all patients stopped their warfarin by missing five doses preoperatively. And lomocord heparin was given on days minus three and day minus two at 200 unit per kilo of deltaparin and at 100 unit per kilo on the morning of the day prior to surgery. Then surgery occurred and then postoperatively they received either placebo or lomocord heparin. Now they were stratified for two different doses. So if the procedure was a low bleeding risk procedure, then the dose of the lomocord heparin deltaparin was 200 unit per kilo or placebo. If it was a high bleeding risk procedure, then it was 5,000 units or placebo. <laughs> and uh, I think our study was the first to, to do that, and that's what the pilot study did as well. And the post-operative dose was given for a minimum of four days and until the INR was two. And the patients were then followed for three months for standard bleeding and uh, thrombotic outcomes. And what did you find? We found, first, that it takes a long time to do studies like this. <laughs> um, we, uh, importantly, again, we included mechanical valves, and our sample size was supposed to be 1,700 patients. We ended up having a total of almost 1,500 patients. And uh, there was study fatigue by the end, and then with the DOAX um, coming available, the, uh, uh, the patients with atrial fibrillation just weren't uh, coming around. Um, to, to go on the study. And as well, bridge uh, study had been reported, um, which showed uh, complementary findings for atrial fibrillation. Um, so basically we found that there was no, uh, no advantage of bridging. The outcomes uh, were the same for, uh, for thrombosis and for bleeding in the two arms. And in fact, in the 300 patients with mechanical valves, there was only one thrombotic event, and that occurred on the uh, delta parent arm. So what's the take-home message at this point? Now that we've had bridge and we have periop too. The take-home message is for, for patients who fulfill our inclusion and exclusion criteria is that post-operative bridging with lomocrit heparin is not necessary uh, for patients with atrial fibrillation and suggested for mechanical valves as well. But our, we only had 300 patients with mechanical valves. Right. But I don't think there's going to be a randomized study of that because it took us... 10 years to get those 300 patients. So in terms of the inclusion and exclusion criteria, what should be known about that? 
So it's, it's more, importantly, more important for, uh, for the valves. So we didn't include patients who had double valves or a history of a stroke or a TIA. Uh, but if they uh, have um, no history of stroke or TIA and single valve, uh, then, then I think the results would be reasonable, reasonably applied. So it's kind of time to stop bridging in this case. Yes, um, although we did give preoperative bridging, and, uh, right. and so that may be another place to do a, a study, but it wouldn't be a randomized study.